So my take is a little bit different because if you hear the last talk, you think we're doing everything right. Right, we have perfect guidelines. There's no bias, it's evidence. And the problem is implementation, but that's not what the question that you posed. Can we do better with the guidelines themselves? Because we know the majority of the clinical trials patients enrolled are Caucasian, white males. So the conclusion that we make, the recommendations that we make from these trials are based on a biased population. And I think that's how I interpreted the question. So I may be wrong, but. So these are my disclosures, which are not relevant to this talk. So for the diverticulitis guidelines, we took a different take, actually. This was intended to be a consensus uh, uh, a document where we were going to collaborate with another society, EAS, or CJ's EAS collaboration, to answer some key questions about the management of acute diverticulitis. But we didn't want to just have experts review the literature and go through just that, that rigorous process. We also wanted to engage a membership of both societies to actually get their input. And that was extremely valuable because that gave us a glimpse about implementation of guidelines. So whatever the recommendations are, whatever the great level of evidence is, do the members really buy in? So we went a little bit further than just putting out recommendations out there. This was the original group. We started off in 2017. We had, uh, as I said, uh, you know, uh, teams from both societies, uh, very engaged, uh, residents, fellows, and attendings. We went through the rigorous process that we learned from the guidelines committee, of course, in terms of systemic reviews, inclusion criteria, nothing special here. Grading of the evidence, same thing. We were using the grade recommendations, level of evidence, um, pretty much standard. We ended up with over 8,000 articles. We reviewed um, 570. And actually, our separate groups looking at the various questions for the management of acute diverticulitis ended up with an initial 132 uh, initial statements and recommendations. Then we had this 18-hour-long Delphi consensus meeting in London where we narrowed it down significantly after going through two rounds of um, of, uh, of uh, voting if we could not achieve 70% agreement among ourselves. This narrowed it down to 51 statements and 41 recommendations along the six domains of acute diverticulitis, which was epidemiology, classification, management of non-complicated uh, complicated emergency surgery, um, elective surgery for diverticulitis. So this, I think, was the magic of this consensus, is that we formulated a survey uh, that went out to all the membership sages at EAS, and the survey was specifically asking people questions, two questions about every single statement and recommendation was, do you agree, yes or no? And if you're not already implementing this in your practice, would you consider ad adopting this in your practice? Really to get a sense of whether people were comfortable with the evidence uh, to, uh, to apply this to their practice. So we got actually a whopping thousand responses in less than six weeks of the survey being open, which was really telling you that people engagement People want to share their opinion. They want to participate in the process. I think that was, this was a really good lesson to learn for us, for SAGES. There was agreement on most statements, which was obviously very reassuring. Um, we had 18 statements where we could not reach a consensus. So then we went to the second level, uh, which we had done before, which means at the actual national meetings, the SAGES 2018 and EAS uh, 2018 meetings, we actually did a live voting, like you did for the GERD consensus. So that was really nice so that we could revote on some of those controversial statements and present the evidence and then revote to see if we could uh, reach a consensus. So that was really a, quite an incredible experience to be able to go through that process and really get, um, I mean, the, the room was packed. People were really engaged at both, at both societal meetings. So in the end, once we uh, presented the level of evidence that supported the original recommendations, we only had one persistent disagreement with one recommendation that I'll talk about in a minute. And then we had other um, disagreements just with likelihood to adopt into practice. So a very good agreement, which was really good. This validates essentially the quality of the guidelines and the validity of the guideline of the recommendations. This was a, a very uh, successful effort. And I think I'm pointing this out not to brag, but because when you get 21,000 downloads, um, on surgical endoscopy, it says something. You know, people are desperately latching onto those guidelines. They really need help uh, when approaching clinical scenarios. So it really falls on us not only to have the best evidence, but to also consider all populations. And this is really what I think the discussion really needs to focus on. I'm just gonna focus on three areas of controversy, which everybody agreed uh, were really things that we need to talk about in terms of imp implementation. One was um, the recommendation of whether or not you don't need a CT scan to diagnose acute diverticulitis. We couldn't win on this one. So um, we could not achieve consensus that just using physical examination, lab work, including CRP, was if, uh, sufficient to diagnose acute diverticulitis. That didn't go. People still want a CT scan, okay? So that's understandable, but there was actually pretty good evidence to support that you may not need it, especially for patients who have just, you know, mild left lower quadrant pain and no fevers or signs of sepsis. Uh, 
the other interesting thing that was um, uh, not achieved a consensus was, and this is the most critical one, is that in patients who are immunocompetent, that they don't need to be treated with PO antibiotics for episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis, which is a majority of the patients that we see in the ER. And we could not get consensus at all um, at SAGES. Um, and at EAS, actually, at, after live voting, after presenting several randomized level one uh, trials con confirming the safety of, of uh, skipping PO antibiotics for uncomplicated diverticulitis, finally, they were, we were able to achieve consensus. And they were willing to consider it and apply it to practice. But at SAGES, we could not achieve consensus. So a really interesting, um, again, the gap between evidence and implementation right out there in the open. And then finally, there's also a big controversy about whether or not everybody needs to be scoped after an episode of diverticulitis. Strong evidence that you don't need to unless there's complicated features or um, a complicated diverticulitis, but if it's uncomplicated resolving, no need to recommend um, a colonoscopy. We could not achieve consensus at SAGES, but we did at EAS. So the bottom line is, after all this, we had a lot of recommendations, everything else was agreed upon. We reached consensus on everything, which really gives you a strong feeling that everybody's on the same page, except for the controversial topics. But we really, looking at it, we really didn't address any issues related to disparities or how certain recommendations may not apply to certain groups um, and to guide uh, our, our recommendations. And so, you know, looking back, and our committee is doing the work now as we're updating our guidelines, what are areas of potential disparities that we're missing? Um, the issue of, um, you know, recommending surgery after an un uncomplicated episode. Everybody agreed, EAS, SAGES members, that there is really no indication, strict indication to recommend surgery. However, we don't know whether or not the decision or recommendation would vary potentially across groups, um, you know, disparity groups. So that's a question that we think there may be some evidence, and that, you know, actually we know there is some evidence that shows that whether or not a patient after an episode of acute diverticulitis that, that resolved is sent to a surgeon for discussion or just monitored or not monitored at all or falls through the cracks. We know there's disparities there along the line of socioeconomic status and uh, racial. And so we haven't looked at it. So we have to incorporate that evidence into uh, these recommendations and acknowledging if there are disparities that they need to be addressed. So maybe an, an additional or an addendum to the to recommendation to state in certain population, you know, this is what we found. Um, and if you don't have any evidence to that effect, at least acknowledge that in our, in our statements and recommendations. Another area of disparity that we know we're gonna to have to tackle in our update is the role of laparoscopy. We know there's significant disparities in the use of laparoscopy, both in the emergency and elective settings across groups. We see this in lab coli. We see this in many other cancer areas. We know it's a fact. Utilization of minimally invasive strategies for certain groups differs significantly based on many factors. But the bottom line is we have not incorporated this data in these recommendations and statements, and we need to. We need to do that work. So in our updated guidelines that we started working on, um, we uh, added the only difference in terms of the categories. We're also specifically looking at indication for elective surgery in uncomplicated um, diverticulitis in addition to complicated, meaning patients who have chronic symptoms like SUD. I mean, you, know, you hear about this all the time. So we have an additional section, but otherwise it's the same uh, areas that we're reinvestigating. We're updating our literature. We're well underway. And so we have already identified new studies that will be relevant and that may or may not impact our recommendations. We're doing that work. But what I want to focus on is the questions. So we are building essentially additional questions in our, in our original uh, uh, PICO questions to really incorporate this. I think you did a pretty decent job when it comes to epidemiology and natural history of acute diverticulitis. We have data on prevalence and risk factors in various populations. So we've already done that work. We haven't seen anything significant across um, uh, ethnic lines, but um, that's, that's just for that particular topic. The areas, as I mentioned, that I want to focus on is really the issue of emergency surgery, the role of minimally invasive surgery, you do it laparoscopically, Hartman procedure, so stoma, no stoma, is there any evidence that in the emergency setting there are differences across socioeconomic and racial line, for example. So we will be adding this, the, a question that will be to the point of do certain vulnerable po populations based on those criteria undergo emergency surgery with the same optimal surgical strategy as non-vulnerable populations and be able to potentially make some statements um, and alter our recommendations based on this. Same thing for the elective surgery setting. This is the one where we know there's plenty of evidence to show significant disparities, so that we will have to really look at um, very closely. Same thing, the same question of vulnerable populations undergo elective surgery for recurrent or complicated diverticulitis at the same rate and for the same indications as non-vulnerable populations. 
And then again, the, the question of elective surgery, uh, whether or not they're being offered, again, laparoscopy uh, versus robotic or just open plus minus stoma. So these questions, there is data. We need to go, we know, we need to go through, through the data and, and hopefully uh, extract some, some um, um, valuable evidence that we can incorporate in, uh, in, uh, in our recommendations. Thank you.